Dear Diary that every filthy bandit writes in this universe. Today I played The Witcher 3, a card game with the longest minigame I've seen. I do appreciate how swiftly it starts. Short tutorial seasoned with cinematic wizardry ends before you're able to recall a full title of Emperor Amir. Then you're out into the White Orchard. Starting location, which funny enough, is the biggest and longest out of the three games. But this time it doesn't fail to communicate what the actual game going to be like. It acts as sort of wild preservation instead of a cage. I still would have preferred being thrown into the open world without a chow or pat on a back, but it's good enough compromise for the sake of less experienced people, I guess. In breaks between grand matches, you are treated with a narrative about Geralt. Geralt of Lyria. Famous butcher of Blaviken, who's on a mission to find his lilac and gooseberries. I mean, yin and yang. I mean, yen and yun. I mean, bang. A proper motivation, but it's all irrelevant, because what you really need are decoys, spies, scorches, medics, unique cards and some time and wisdom to come to a conclusion that Nevgadian deck is the best of them all. But let's talk about side game for a little bit. I think White Orchard was uh, one of the most exciting experiences, thanks to novelty. First things first, I ditched an old fart Vizimir and went looting every house. Before I knew that most of the time they contained nothing more than garbage like ores or broken rakes. Then my business model turned into a murder spree of every animal I came across. I started selling their hides and meat as the only source of income I knew at the time. Until I stole something and got beat up by guards, losing all my pretty 72 blood coins, which was to me like enormous treasure, naturally. It sobered me up right away and led to a conclusion that I probably should start doing some quests in this game. The first fight with the griffin reminded me of Monster Hunter, which is surprising considering I never played it. It was good rush of energy, it was technical and with the learning strategy as you go, right in the middle of the battle. Constant sidestep and dodge mashing went so intense on my fingers that they got sore and that's probably the highest praise one can give to a fighting sequence. Thanks to the fresh experience, for me it was the most memorable boss fight in the whole game, not counting expansions of course. So I've got on the same level of energy only after 150 hours when I fought the Meme Prince in uh, the Hearts of Stone expansion. Gameplay is the weakest part as tradition has it, however this time it was on ok level. Nothing close to a circus of the second game and for the first 20 hours flowing quite well. And it would be fine if not for the fact that the game is a bit longer than that. The way you fight changes somewhere around that 20 hour mark, where you build up the abilities that alter, in my case, signs. After that there is no more changes, maybe you'll get a new bomb, a new potion, maybe numbers will be a bit higher, but battle itself stays static to the end gradually growing more and more routine, eventually evolving into a grave boredom. And it bored me so thoroughly that it went all the way on the other side of the spectrum. You see, killing monsters became so mundane, so natural and trivial, I started to imagine that's how a typical witcher would feel like every time he sees another drowner. Oh, how I hate them. Or another wraith, or another flying shit draconid. Nothing is surprising anymore, no sore fingers, no sitting on the edge of your seat, only cool calculation and calm repetition of deeply cemented moves and reflexes. So it turned in sort of a role-playing experience and uh, helped with the immersion, you may say. Alchemy remains being unwanted as a botchling. Ugly baby of the second game attempts to appease with convenience of picking less herbs and refreshing potions upon meditation. For which I thank it from the bottom of my chest cavity, the same way I would thank a bad movie for being one and a half hour long instead of three hours. It became an achievement list, you gotta brew them all to have them as useless collection on a shelf. There were some examples of good application at the beginning, like fighting the first werewolf required Moondust Bomb greatly or fighting first few powerful raids, but then leveling system kicks in and all that tactical tinsel becomes a waste, when you can just club your enemies to death without butting an eye. 
I think the only game changer potion I found was Golden Oreo. In enhanced versions, it makes poison heal you instead. Also, changing duration of oil lasting on a sword to a number of strikes was a good idea and seems more logical instead of a timer. Horse riding in The Witcher feels like driving an indestructible car. But instead of flying off a cliff or crashing into a wall, Roach does a full stop no matter the speed you were on. I had an abundance of Roach glitches, but they were mostly harmless and provided sort of comic relief. Hmm. No horse I know walks on two legs. Oh, nice! When there is horse riding in games, I always wish they would steal it from Mountain Blade. Game was released in 2008, and somehow I haven't seen better controls for it ever since. And there is nothing extremely convoluted even, it's pretty simple. Horses, for starters, should descend to us simple mortals and be killable. Not because I'm a sadist and want to see every animal suffer, contrary to the start of this video, but because it's the way they function in real life. After all, Geralt names every horse Roach for a reason. You should also feel like you are controlling a life animal. You can turn, regulate the speed, but it moves on its own, it carries you. It's not a vehicle where you need to keep pressing a pedal. Same goes for boats, where wind you would think should carry you. Every time I look at sailing, I can't accept what I'm seeing, because in order for it to work as it's shown, every helmsman should be an airbender and uh, have a full control of the wind at all times. I guess we could imagine that Geralt suddenly uses his art sign constantly to move the damn thing. Furthermore, the only other people we saw controlling these boats were sorceresses or witchers. But hey... That's just a... Fog's thick as curdled milk. Never took you for a poet. Oh, but I am one. Wanna hear a limerick? Sure. Lambert, Lambert, what a prick. Not bad. Story in The Witcher 3 shines once again. On top of well-written dialogue, we now also have even better voice acting and facial expressions able to convey subtle or not-so-emotions. Good display of subtle ones are conversations between Geralt and Triss. There's also a lot of references to previous games and characters from original books. I very much enjoyed, again, a soft repeat of Search for Ciri, which was a main plot of The Witcher saga. If anything, guys from CD Projekt are perfect at translating and adapting characters from the original, as well as merging the new ones with the existing universe. My personal favorites are Emirvar Emrys, voiced by Charles Dance, a dream come true as voices go for Emperor of Nilfgaard, Dijkstra, hiding behind his boorish appearance a great amount of intelligence, and despite the opportunity to take revenge on Geralt for his broken leg in the books, he lets it go and moves on. Same we see in the game, he puts a playful facade of displeasure, but it's easy to see behind all that uh, his respect for Geralt's goals and kind heart towards honorable actions. He helps mages to escape Novigrad from the clutches of the church, helps Geralt multiple times with information and passes, and even after learning that Dandelion was the one who stole his treasure, lets it slide. In speech he does before recruiting Geralt into assassination plot, you can also hear his values and constructive views on rule. I served Vizimir, Radovid's father, was his head of intelligence for more than two decades. Together we transformed Redania, made it the North's most powerful realm. Any idea what made it strong? Its armies, I'd wager. And you'd bloody lose, you idiot! Mass mobilization? Inciting peasants to take up their scythes, straighten them. Where's the art in that? Much harder to build a strong state with healthy commerce, manufacturing, solid alliances, progressive science, and fair, independent courts that hand down just judgments. Vizimir and I managed to do just that through years of fucking hard work. I will not sit on my hands as that little shit squanders that! After all that, the way his storyline ended was way too crude. Geralt, please stay and do nothing while I murder three people you are friends with, because I am sure wishers are always neutral, right? Even if we assume that Dijkstra always acts out of calculation and all those previous kind of acts just simply deeds that happen to align with his goals, 
For the men who are able to read people like books... Just here for the coin. Ah, Marigold playing the cynical materialist. I love it. To assume that Geralt would just not intervene there is ridiculous. And when Geralt refuses to allow massacre to happen, exceptionally clever man Dijkstra is unable to foresee how sword battle against the Witcher always ends. And attacks Geralt like dim wit common bandit. Furthermore, I like Dijkstra much more than Roach, Vess or Tyler altogether, but the way this scene played out leave no choice but to stop this madness. Of course killing Dijkstra in process. Also adding to that how assassination itself played out, again just a bloodbath on the street with no careful scheming and planning. The same way you could just straight up storm the red of his ship and murder him, there is even less people between you and him, instead of pretending to play spies and masterminds. Same crudeness shows in the last battle with the Wild Hunt, after build up for the duration of the whole game, we get a rushed one-on-one -on -one fighting sequence where Geralt dominates Sparrowhawk with plain brute force, no tricks involved, then pokes his eye out and moves along with his day. Those things are annoying, but with Witcher games it's always been about experience along the way. The characters is delight to watch and listen to, the delivery, the presentation, the writing is just hypnotizing. I'm so pleased the world's still able to astound you, Geralt. I actually envy you that sense of wonder common in children, knights errant and morons. When one of the major characters is on the screen, you can't pull your eyes off them. Even characters that are simply disgusting, like Horson Jr. or Fanatic Manga, are able to captivate and summon a level of interest toward them. Speaking of metal, this goblet's silver. Making sure I'm not a Doppler. Ah, oh, it's immediately apparent. A professional. I find that refreshing. But to answer your question, one can never be too careful. You'd be surprised how many come here turn to rancid jelly as soon as they grip the goblet. My best story in The Witcher has gotta be the Master Mirror plot, which is pretty much the whole Hearts of Stone expansion. It was very much needed, especially because I started it after sailing in Skellige Sea, trying to clear all points of interest. And doing nothing but murdering underwater drowners with a crossbow, still have no idea how that works, clearing countless amount of smuggler caches, and dispatching swarms of sirens. All in all, nothing but 10 hours of fun. It was enough to lose my sanity, get it back, lose it again, quit the game for 2 months and come back. At least they know what they did. So, there was a problem with smugglers caches. Hearts of Stone felt like uh, devs had one deep blissful sleep in a decade and came back renovated. Story is a lot more focused, very well structured, with a lot more freedom and tone and jokes. The whole heist thing is a big parody in itself. You son of a bitch. I'm in. There is a bunch of references as well. Never say no to a hostage taker. It's in the manual. Now, are, are you gonna tell me no again? No, I'm not. No, uh, wrong answer. Eliminate no vocabulary, Polly. Never use no, don't, won't, or can't. All right? It eliminates options. Understand, Reginald? My name's not Reg. <laughs> You're not supposed to it's say uh... not. But of course, Gunter Odim steals the show, always lurking in the back, causing mischief with one hand and helping with another, with beautifully devilish trick in the end, making all gear fulfill a seemingly impossible part of the contract himself. Gunter is certainly my cup of tea, and when, upon re-recording some footage I found him in the very beginning of the game, it invoked in me incredibly eerie feeling, because I completely forgot about our first meeting as the game took quite some time to complete. I remember having conversation with some eccentric guy there, with the thought that we will probably meet at some point, but then his face got erased from my memory. And the fact that they included Master Mirror in the main quest, even before the DLC was released, was so sly and playful. I love it. Also, let's just appreciate the fact that Gantra Dim calls himself a merchant of mirrors in the world where there is not a single working mirror with the reflection. Now let's talk about another high pillar which the 3 stands on, the world. It's huge and visually entirely stunning. Nature looks realistic and familiar to what you can find east of Europe. Birds and wild animals add to the immersion greatly. Well, when there are not countless packs of wolves you have to dispatch in your travels. Houses and villages completed with the attention to detail. I never felt like something was missing or incomplete. Cities even more fanatically executed. There are not some ten and a half houses every NPC pretends to call a city. 
they are truly massive and full of life. When I look at something like Buclair, it's hard for me to believe I can go inside. There is always a thought that it's some kind of background image, that it must be only partially accessible, but no. The fact that you are able to roam inside these architectural giants adds a lot to a sense of freedom. Now, that first burst of visual pleasure unfortunately fades away rather fast, and you're left with a quite hollow place. The only way you can interact with population consists of ramming into passers-by while you're on your way to the next objective. There is a void where sandbox elements should be, which devs were trying to fill with what they know best, the quests. But with more elusive ones, those on which not everyone might stumble upon, they can be a bit hidden or be accessible only for a small period of time. It's good that they tried, without these scripted little encounters would be worse, but it's just impossible to substitute for situations players would create themselves, if given the tools. Because these tools are lacking, eventually Witcher becomes a museum. Pretty to look at, but sealed behind a wall of glass, as you walk the halls from one quest to another, from one point of an interest to the other, without really feeling like a part of this world. And also, when every possible content is marked on your map, you can imagine how deeply it cripples the fun of exploration. But the world itself, by which I mean the map and design, is great. The problem that brings it down a step again appears to be lying in gameplay. Economy in The Witcher quickly lost its charm compared to the beginning. Earning money proved to be easy, when finding something to spend said money on not so. There is barely anything I could do with all the gold I got. I had to give poor merchants the coin by buying runestones I didn't really need, so they could have money to unburden me from all the blood-soaked loot. Loot itself was unremarkable, there is no difference what sword you are using as long as you keep switching them to suit your level. Because of that, every sword you get to use, for a few hours or less, is like some randomized gun from Borderlands. I remember the moment when Geralt pompously names his sword after a cheese when you find it in some ancient ruins. And of course you go to the first merchant and sell it because it's useless. If it was only one moment like that, I would just laugh and shrug it off. But then the same thing happened with Kraken Crate, now the most influential man of Skillig, honoring Geralt with not just some puny present, but with heirloom blade of his family carried by generations. And of course it goes straight to Trash Buyer. Then the same thing happened with the legendary master swordsmith Hattori, and the sword he forged for at least a week. The only unique and memorable sword I found was Arendite, given by a Lady of the Lake, as a reference to Arturian legends. This time, lofty representation matched the power of the weapon they give you. Partially to blame are overpowered witcher sets. The swords, the armor, once you find the first witcher set, there is pretty much no gear that would be better, so the only reason you would want to craft or wear anything other than witcher sets would be purely for cosmetic purposes. And some of cosmetic decisions were questionable. As a sign user, I was supposed to use a griffin set, as it gave bonuses to signs, but it looked awful, coloring like somebody rubbed in cloth with swamp weed, heavy clunky mail everywhere, and hands dressed in oven gloves. Though I know where it might come in handy. Give me the face! In the oven! Throw him in the oven! So I wore School of the Cat set instead, fit for melee builds. Though if I knew how slick uh, School of the Bear looked like, I would probably pick that. And my personal favorite would be Nilfgaardian leather armor. You may say Nilfgaardians conquered me by fashion, and that's been my not very short experience with Witcher 3, that took 212 hours to complete, and I'm giving it 85 out of 100. You think universals exist as real and distinct entities, or only as mental constructs? Oh, 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 oh. Yeah, sounds about right. <laughs>